Yeah, 20 years later, that's an interesting thing. I mean, these things do, do have a, an afterlife that you don't imagine when you're doing them. It's kind of a throwaway medium when you're starting out and you're making these low-budget horror pictures that you don't know if anybody's going to go see. And then to have somebody, you know, come up and say, well, you know, what do you think of it today? After 20 years, is, uh, it's amazing that anybody cares. You know, I mean, it was a modern movie in 1980, and uh, time has been kind to it, I think, but the movies that they make today are different. <laughs> The guy who started the Wolfman stuff was a writer named Kurt Siodmak, who uh, wrote the screenplay for The Wolfman in 1941. And uh, he came up with a lot of lore about uh, full moons and, and uh, Wolfbane and a whole bunch of stuff that became sort of accepted as the traditional uh, stuff for werewolf movies. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf, the Wolfbane blues. The Wolfman is sort of the popular culture idea of, of, of the werewolf, uh, and people have commented on, you know, how come his shirt is always tucked in and, and stuff. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think about that stuff. Uh, and, was, and was a popular and neurotic enough character to reappear in several more movies. Um, and uh, really kind of became the prototype for the Wolfman. I'm gone now. And heaven help you. But the, uh, the genre started to thin out a little in the 70s. Um, there was The Beast Must Die, which was a sort of whodunit uh, werewolf picture that didn't really quite work and also in which werewolves were played by large dogs and, and, and real wolves, which, is, which was always disappointing to me. I mean, the idea of going to see a werewolf picture and have, it, have them employ a real wolf instead of any kind of a guy in a suit or makeup was always considered cheating, you know, because that, that wasn't supernatural enough. And that's certainly the way we felt when we did The Howling. I think the essential difference is that everybody that did The Howling was familiar with the Universal films. With the Universal films, uh, I think, would only have echoed uh, 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 legends and tales. It seemed like it would be more fun to try to take the myth into the, the 80s. Joe picked up on the rules of the werewolf and uh, decided that would be a strong element to structure the story. Full Moon, the Silver Bullet, and, and most of them don't want to be werewolves and don't want to be bad. <laughs> The idea that if you get bitten by a werewolf, you become one yourself is, is sort of, you know, the le legitimate, quote unquote, lore. <laughs> Certain werewolves, like, you know, alpha werewolves or whatever, can change at, at will. But if you've been, if you're a victim, if you've been bitten by a werewolf, uh, the, tr the full moon triggers it. Isn't that how they become a werewolf? They have to be bitten by another werewolf? Yeah, but is bitten by a werewolf and lives, becomes a werewolf himself. The clip from The Wolfman is in the movie not really as a joke. It's, it's in there because, uh, for one thing, it encapsulates the entire uh, uh, werewolf ethos. It tells you it's the scene that explains about being a werewolf. And it also is the scene that allows you to realize, which I think was a first for this kind of movie, that the characters in the movie know as much about the subject as you do. For a movie to take place today, um, it's ridiculous to think that people don't know what werewolves are or have never heard of werewolves. Of course they have, but, it, but from the movies, that's the reference. You find if you look at some of the pictures that, that the lore changes based on what budget the people had to work with. In, in the Hammer, first Hammer Dracula picture, uh, there's a scene where Peter Cushing is speaking into a gramophone and he's talking about how, how, how unlike what people think, vampires can't change into wolves. You know, there was a reason for that. And, and how they don't turn into bats either. Well, they didn't have the money. They, and they knew they'd do it badly, so they said, well, let's just find a reason to, to not do it. And let's maximize what we can do well. We'll find out if any of Eddie's killings were on a full moon. Hey, that's a lot of Hollywood baloney. There's a scene with Dick Miller in this bookstore where he basically debunks every aspect of werewolf lore that we can't afford to do. <laughs> Your classic werewolf can change shape any time it wants, day and night, whenever it takes a notion to. That's why I call them shapeshifters. I got a dozen books on it. What we were saying was, well, this is the way it really is. This is the way what really werewolves are really like. It's not the way you've seen it in the old movies. 
Bob Ramey and, and Apco Embassy, they wanted a, a werewolf movie. They wanted there to, to be some scares and, and, and some laughs. That was, that was a bonus, that was great. But they, you know, they just wanted something they could sell. They knew it was a high concept. Uh, there hadn't been a werewolf movie in a long time, so it was you know, considered a very commercial idea. I came onto The Howling late. I, I, uh, it was originally developed by another uh, director, a guy named uh, Jack Conrad, who I think gets a producer credit. And he had um, optioned the book and written a screenplay of his own that I guess he had managed to set up at Alco Embassy, but they started to get cold feet about it. Uh, Dan Blatt was the executive producer who sort of put all this stuff together. And at a certain point, I think they, for whatever reason, decided that Jack wasn't going to direct this. So I called him up and I said, look, we have this werewolf movie and I think we're going to gonna, you know, make a change you know, in the directing department and would you be interested? I had had done one and a half movies <laughs> by this point. So I mean, it wasn't exactly a, a, you know, a great coup for them to get me. But on the other hand, uh, I, I knew Bob Ramey, the guy who was running Apco Embassy at the time, because he had worked for Roger Corman as a, in, in publicity. So this, this movie was at the, initially a million and a half, so that, that was a tremendous amount of money to us. Uh, but I mean, the idea of just working quickly and cheaply and being able to put a lot up on the screen for not a lot of money was something that we all learned and never forgot uh, working for Roger Corman. I um, was taken off of the movie that I was going to do, which was Jaws 3, People Zero at Universal, which uh, looked like it was, for various reasons, about to fall apart. Uh, and I sort of went on to The Howling. And when confronted with the screenplay, I think that it became apparent that we needed to rewrite it. He, he was not crazy about the script, but he, you know, wanted to do a werewolf movie, so he said, well, if we can work on the script, you know, I'm, I'm in. It's based on a novel by Gary Brenner, and um, a lot of the themes and, uh, and incidents in the movie are uh, duplicated in the book. Basically, we said, well, well, you know, we have this book, I mean, we should try to stick fairly closely to it. Uh, and it really wasn't until John Sayles got involved that we pretty much just said, let's just throw out the book and do whatever we want, call it The Howling. I had uh, previously worked with John Sayles on Piranha, which I think was his first screenplay. And uh, I suggested John, and he came up with the idea of setting the action in this sort of spa for werewolves. John's you know, real big contribution was the whole idea of, of, of doing this sort of satiric commentary on self-help gurus and this guy that basically had this, this, this colony where all these werewolves were in therapy because they were obviously tortured by the fact that they were werewolves and so he was, he was a psychiatrist that decided to fill that niche of uh, being the psychiatrist for, for the werewolf community. Okay, tell me, doctor, how crazy am I? I'm going to recommend that you go out to the colony for a week or two. John was also working at the time on Alligator, which was, um, and, and since both these pictures were really quite cheap, uh, we would vie for who was going to pay to fly him out, and, and each company would try to figure out how to exploit him once he was out here on the dime of the other company. Whenever you'd go to visit him to you know, look at new pages and stuff, you'd knock on the door, you'd say, who is it? And you'd say who it was, and then you'd hear, Arsh! you'd be taking the paper out of the typewriter and Arsh! putting the other paper in because he was really working on the other guy's picture. Uh, and I'm convinced to this day that one of the dream sequences for our picture ended up an alligator, and vice versa. Yeah. Well, the casting director for this picture was uh, Susan Arnold, who was um, the son of Jack Arnold, who had directed uh, The Incredible Shrinking Man and Creature from the Black Lagoon and a lot of other movies at Universal. I actually went in and auditioned. I, I read for it. And then they couldn't find anybody to play my husband. And Chris and I were engaged at the time. Knew if I'd said, you ought to read my fiance, that was going to be the first thing that they were going to not do. So I said, you know, I know this actor. Um, What's his name? Christopher something. Stone! Christopher Stone. <laughs> so they found him and they called him in and he ran in and read and he got the part on his own. Hey, I got it. First shot. Dan called, I don't know, the next day and I picked up the phone and he went, Oh, Dee, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to get Christopher Stone. I guess I dialed the wrong number. And he said, No, you dialed the right number. And there was this long pause and he went, Oh, you're not telling me this. You're not telling me that you guys... I said, yeah, we're engaged. Hello? There's no crime in that. Yeah. I had seen Belinda in Cannonball, no, and uh, Susie had um, suggested her for Piranha. 
and uh, we, we met her and, and we, did, we did Piranha, and she was great and, and very, very tolerant of the stuff we put her through. I um, mean, we, we dragged, her, dragged her from the back of a motorboat with rubber fish on her, and I mean, it was like, what a, what a trooper. Um, and, she was, and she was wonderful and, and very charming and natural, and so when it came time to do the, the Howling, there was this sort of second banana character who, of course, gets killed, and I, there was, obviously, this was, this was the girl. I mean, she, she gets killed in almost every picture she makes. <laughs> She's perfect for this. Hello, Eddie. Bob Picardo was another discovery of Susan Arnold's. And um, the, the audition scene that we did was the scene in the booth. Can I turn around and see you? Bob came in and did this reading with Susan playing the character. I sat her in a chair, and I got behind her and would not let her turn her head and look at me, and I just came right over her shoulder. I think the reason I was hired was I creeped her out. I'm gonna light up your whole body, Karen. It was immediate that this guy was, you know, great. He was a terrific actor, and he had one other major characteristic, which was he was willing to sit still for Rob Bottin to cover him with latex and all that other stuff that he does for hours and days. Sun worshippers, moon worshippers, Satanists, the man said people used to hang around here and shoplift. The howling uh, <clears throat> got me a little pissed at first because uh, he said, I got your day's work on the picture. I said, that's all there is? That's all there is? You don't fit in. You don't look like a werewolf. You don't look like, forget it. I said, all right, take the day's work. And we got down there and it started to become my favorite part. Crazy fuck. And to this day, it is still my favorite part with 150 pictures behind me. Hey. Dick Miller is in all the movies that I do. That's it. You name it, I got the book. Every time I read a script, it's like, you know, you read the script and you try to figure out what you want to do with it or if you want to do it, and then you, and there's that other nagging question. Where's the part for Dick Miller? Because if there isn't one, well, how can I do this? Okay, guys, this is it. The very first thing we shot on this movie was the porno film, because that had to be in uh, finish so we could use it in the projection booth. Mike Finnell and I went into my garage and um, shot a um, fake porno movie. And this very nice girl came, whose name I can't remember, and we had two production assistants who put on like stocking masks and stuff, and we had this, um, we brought in this bed, and we basically shot um, a silent porn film. It was kind of uncomfortable doing it. It wasn't like a lot of fun. Uh, you'd think it would be, but it, it wasn't. It was, it was kind of creepy. The girl from Kansas going into the porno theater was not real comfortable. <laughs> I mean, I just do. It was a real porn shop. I mean, we didn't have to bring anything in. We just had to hide the things that you couldn't put in the movie. So lots of little pieces of tape and price tags on the appropriate parts. And I don't think she wanted to go in there. I mean, I remember Joe trying to talk her in, and she went in with her, you know, hands over her eyes so she wouldn't see these evil things. The unease and discomfort that you see uh, was real. She literally couldn't look at anything. In the film, you know, she enters and she goes through and she's very nervous about everything and the camera sort of leads her and she goes back to that booth and that's basically, basically the way we shot it. She really was uh, ready to flip out when the, uh, the little porno film was, was playing and Eddie the Mangler is sitting in the shadows. <laughs> Parker. The one thing I like about Joe is that he's very loyal and he um, tends to use the same people in movie after movie. I mean, I like character actors and, and I also like to work with my friends. So by the time I had gotten to the point of doing The Howling, I had already worked with Kevin McCarthy, so I asked him to be in the picture. Get her ready for the 11 o'clock report. There's been a lot of talk. Now there is a pro. And obviously Dick Miller and Bob Picardo, who we worked with the first time on this movie. See, I like to put the writer in the movie if possible for, for a couple of reasons. One, it's nice to have the writer on the set whenever possible. And uh, if you're in a, on a location, chances are, you know, they're not going to want to fly him there. But if you hire him as an actor, you can sort of make a case for it. Only thing that freaked me out since I've been working here is the night old Stu Walker came in. I think the picture took uh, about 28 days to shoot, and then there may have been four days of reshoots. You know, the story and the budget both sort of dictated a look to the film. There were some locations in Mendocino, beautiful locations, which we couldn't afford to stay in very long, so we shot the heck out of them. It was freezing cold up there, and by the second day I was running this fever, so most of the shoot up there in the werewolf land, I was in a haze. I mean, I don't know how I ever actually read my meter because I was just delirious. But 
you know, I guess that added to it. All the shots inside that little uh, shed, it was really just John and I in the shed. And, and so, you know, you're just working off your own imagination. Joe wasn't even there, because nobody else could fit in the shed besides John, the camera, and myself. Belinda, I believe, goes to a, a cabin, and then she runs through the woods, and then she runs up to another door, and then she goes into it. Uh, one place was, I think, in Mendocino County, and then a month later, we were, uh, we, we shot the interior where she arrived on a stage, and then the portion where she ran was in Griffith Park on another night, and then the cabin she ran to was somebody's house that we just spotted along the road up in the mountains. Nobody was home, and we just set up and shot it. <laughs> we had a production designer named Bob Burns, Robert Burns, uh, who had been the production designer on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and, uh, and I think had a great deal of influence on the success of that movie because I didn't realize until I went to Bob's house uh, how much of the decor of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre had actually come from the mind of, of Bob Burns. He was good at regular stuff too, but, but he brought a certain um, queasiness to the uh, props and stuff that, that we had. And the idea of Marsha's cabin and the way she lived and you know, with dead animal skins and, and bones and, and stuff. I mean, Bob just ate that stuff up. Where is he? He was here this morning. But, and it changed my life, I gotta tell you, to work in a real morgue. And we were guaranteed that it was gonna be empty. It was gonna be just empty, you know, uh, containers. And when we got there, it was filled. There was only two left, and we were, they were waiting for what they call a, a delivery. So we had to sit there for hours until another cadaver came down, another body, and they stuck it in. And then we had ours, which was empty, where we put our, you know, the, where, where was gonna be the empty werewolf one. And uh, a day in the morgue was enough that we, as soon as we got it, we wrapped early, and I went home, and I tell you, I had a new, new view of life. I'll cook it later. Elizabeth Brooks was, uh, had only been in one other picture, which I think is family plot. And I think she kicks a gravestone. I don't think she had a big part. And once we put her in the makeup and, and, and the wig, I mean, she was incredible. I mean, it was every, uh, Charles Adams would have died to have her play Morticia. Of course, she's got a big nude scene to do with Dee Wallace's boyfriend. And Dee was, you know, sort of like, oh, I don't, know. I don't think I want to see this. <laughs> I just remember Joe coming up to me uh, like three or four days before, and he went, so, um, so D, um, um, I said, what? What is it about the scene? He said, well, yeah, I was just, um, so are you coming to the set that day? And I said, I guess you don't want me there. And he said, well, I think it would be a little uncomfortable. I said, I think it'd probably be most uncomfortable for me. So I went drinking that night. <laughs> we were shooting at night, and it's kind of cold in Mendocino. And there's a fire, and we were supposed to you know, make love. And, uh, and so John Hora, the DP, has got these fire filters. You know, you put them up on your eye, and it makes the fire blurry. And he says, well, how about this one? And these actors are standing there like, naked. So how about this one? I said, fine. He said, well, how about this one? I said, well, fine. You know, well, I got this one's better. And I looked down, he's got a whole box of filters. And he's got 25, 60 filters. He wants me to look at every one. I said, John, they're freezing. We have to shoot the movie. Well, I had it in my contract also that there would be no additional nudity added by anyone. 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning, I walk into the scene in the barn. I think it's the first time I really find out that the colony is all what it is. I walked into the barn, and I looked up, and there were about 10 ladies with their boobs hanging out. And I went, OK, what the hell is this? Well, the studio wanted more, and they thought and for four and blah. I said, I'm not shooting this. This is in my contract. Oh, come on, D. I said, I'm not shooting this. The crew was laughing. Now, you know when the crew's laughing at 10 women with their boobs hanging out, you've gone over the line. <laughs> I said, I'm not doing it. 
Oh, poor Mike Fennell. Oh, Dee, don't do this. We're, we're out of time. It's Dee, Dee, Dee. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not doing it. So they called Dan Blatt. Half an hour later, <laughs> you hear his car coming through the farm, right? 